So as we look out there, according to the Drake equations we just discussed, it seems impossible to me that there's not civilizations everywhere. So how do we look at them? This process of SETI. I have to put on my scientist hat and just say, my gut feeling is that dumb life, so to speak, is common. I am a little agnostic about, I, I can see ways in which intelligent civilizations may be sparse. Yeah. But but until you know, we got to go look. It's all it's all armchair armchair astronomy. So that's that's from a sort of rigorous scientific yeah. perspective. From yeah. my bro science perspective, it seems again smoking this the aforementioned weed. Uh, weed. Yeah. It's after the bong. It, hit, it I, I mean, honestly, it's just <laughs> yeah. it's it's really just yeah. it was impossible mm -hmm. to me that there's not uh, potentially dead but advanced civilizations everywhere in our galaxy. Yeah, yeah, the potentially dead part. I think right. It could be that like. Making civilizations is easy. They just don't last long. So what we when we went out there, we'd find a lot of extinct civilizations. Extinct right? civilizations. Uh, yeah, apex predators don't survive. Like they they get get better, 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 yeah. better, and they right die, and kill themselves all somehow. Anyway, so uh, just how do we find them? Yeah. So SETI, search for extraterrestrial technology, is a term that I am not fond of using anymore. I mean, some people in my field are. So I'm sorry folks. Um, but I'm really, what I really like is the idea of techno signatures. Cause I think, you know, clear to me, SETI is the, first of all, intelligence. We're not really looking for intelligence. We're looking for technology. I mean, you know, um, and, and SETI, the classic idea of SETI is the radio telescopes, you know, in contact, Jody Foster with the headphones, that whole thing is still part. It's still active. There's still great things going on with it, but suddenly this whole new window opened up. When we discovered exoplanets, we now found a new way to look for intelligent civilizations or life in general in a way that doesn't have any of the assumptions that had to go into the classic radio study. And specifically what I mean is we're not looking for somebody sending us a beacon. You really needed that with the classic model um, for a bunch of different reasons. You had to assume they wanted to be found and they were sending you a super powerful beacon. Now, because we know exactly where to look and we know exactly how to look, we can just go about looking for passive signatures of the civilization going about its civilizationing business, you know, without asking whether they want to be contacted or not. So this is what we call a biosignature or a techno signature. It is an imprint in the light from the planet of the activity of a biosphere or a technosphere. And that's really important. You know, that, that, that is why kind of the whole Gaia idea ends up being astrobiological, that biospheres and technospheres are so potent, they change the entire planet. And you can see that from 20 light years. So let's give an example of a biosignature to start off with, which would be a signature of a biosphere, oxygen right? In our, on earth, at least we know that oxygen is only in the atmosphere because life put it there. If life went away, the oxygen and particularly oxygen and methane, that pair, they would disappear, you know, very quickly. They'd react away. They'd all be gone. So if you find a planet with oxygen and methane, that's a good bet that there's a biosphere there. Okay. What about technospheres? Technospheres, this is what, you know, so I'm the principal investigator on the first grant NASA has ever given to do these kind of exoplanet techno signatures. NASA was kind of, for reasons we can talk about, NASA had gotten pretty gun shy about funding anything about intelligent life. But okay, what's an example of a techno signature? Well, one could be atmospheric pollution. I'm going to put pollution in quotes here because it doesn't have to be pollution, but gases like chlorofluorocarbons. So we've dumped you know, we dumped a huge amount of chlorofluorocarbons into the atmosphere by mistake. Um, it was affecting the ozone, but we put so much in there that actually, we, this is one of the things we did. We did a paper where we showed you could detect it across interstellar distances. You could look at the atmosphere, look at the light coming from a distant planet, pass the light through a spectrograph and see the, the spectral lines, the fingerprint, the spectral fingerprint mm -hmm. of chlorofluorocarbons in an atmosphere. And that would for sure tell you that that were, there was a technological civilization there because there's no other way to make chlorofluorocarbons except through some kind of industrial process. So you're looking for, in the case of the biosphere, you're looking for anomalies in the spectrograph. I wouldn't necessarily call these anomalies. I'm looking for things that, uh, for biosignature, I'm looking for things that a geosphere, right? You know, that just rock and air wouldn't produce on its own. What kind of chemicals would life produce? Right, and that's that's part of the, that's the interesting thing, right? So that's what, you know, so we can use Earth as an example, right? We can say, look, oxygen, we know 
there would be no oxygen in the atmosphere if it wasn't for uh, dimethyl sulfide, which is a uh, compound that uh, phyloplankton dump into the atmosphere. A lot of it that's uh, sometimes mentioned. And there was even there was a paper that somebody wrote where uh, it was like, well, we're not saying we see it, but, you know, there's a bunch of noise in the spectra right there. Um, so, you know, there's a whole list of things that Earth has done that are in the atmosphere that might be biosignatures. But now we're reaching an interesting point. The field has matured to the point where we can start asking about agnostic biosignatures, mm. things that have nothing to do with Earth's history. But we think that that would still be indications of this weirdness we call life, right? What What is it in general that life does that leaves an imprint? So one of these things could be the structure of the network of chemical reactions, that biology always produces very different chemical networks, who's reacting with who, than just rock and water, right? So, so there's been some proposals for networked, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, biosignatures, uh, information theory. You can use, you can try and look at the information that is in the different, um, compounds, uh, uh, that are, you find in the atmosphere. And maybe that information shows you like, oh, there's too much information here. There, there must've been biology happening. It's not just rock. Same thing for techno. We're, that's what we're working on right now. That for techno signatures as well. So how do you detect techno signatures? Okay, so with techno signatures, I gave the example of chlorofluorocarbon. Yeah. So that would be an example of, and again, that one is a non agnostic one because we sort of like, oh, we produced chlorofluorocarbons. Maybe they will, right? And there's solar panels, right? You can actually, the glint off of solar panels um, will produce a, the way the light is reflected off of solar panels, whether, no matter what it's made out of, actually. Um, there was a paper that um, uh, Manasvi Lingam and Avi Loeb did in, I think it was 2017. We've just followed up on it that actually could act as a techno signature. You'd be able to see in the reflected light, this sort of big jump that would occur because of uh, uh, city lights, city artificial illumination. If the if there's really like, you know, large scale cities like, you know, Coruscant in Star Wars or Trantor in the foundation, those city lights would be detectable, you know, the spectral imprint of those across 20, 30 light years. So, you know, our job in this grant is to develop the first ever library of techno signatures. Nobody's really ever thought about this before. So we're trying to come up with all the possible ideas for what a civilization might produce that could be visible across, uh, you know, uh, interstellar distances. And are these good ones or is these ones going to be hard to detect or such? City lights. So if a planet is all lit up with artificial light across 20 to 30 light years, we yeah. can see it. Yeah. If you looked at Earth at night from a distance where, you know, uh, looked at its spectra and you had sensitive, sensitive enough instruments, you'd be able to see all the sodium lights and the reflected light off of, you know, they, they um, bounce off the ground, right? The, the light bounces off the ground. So you'd convolve the, the sodium lamps with the reflected spectra from the ground. And yeah, you'd be able to see that there's city lights. Now, increase that by a factor of a thousand, you know, if you had a, 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 a trantor. And you'd be able to detect that across interstellar distances. Thomas Beatty did this work, who's now working with us. What do you think is the most detectable thing about Earth? Uh, wow, we just, this is uh, fun. We just have a, a Sophia Schief, just who's part of our collaboration, just did a paper. We did Earth from Earth. If you were looking at Earth with Earth technology for a bunch of different techno signatures, how close would you have to be to be able to detect them? And most of them turn out to be, you'd have to be pretty close, at least out to the Oort cloud. But actually, it's, it is our radio signatures still that is still most detectable. By the way, when you said you had to be pretty close and then you said the Oort cloud, that's not very close. But you mean like from an interstellar Interstellar distance. Because the real question, you know, what we really want to know is like, I'm sitting here on Earth, I'm looking at these exoplanets. Yeah. The nearest star is four light years away. So that's like the minimum distance. Um, so what can, if I'm looking at exoplanets, what kind of signals could I see? What is detectable about Earth with our current technology from the, our nearest solar system? Oh my God, there's all kinds of stuff. Well, like our, our, our the, 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 um, chlorofluorocarbons, you can see, you know, you can see Earth's pollution yeah. and, you know, I think city lights, you had to be within, you know, pr within the solar system. If they do direct imaging of Earth. They're going to need much more powerful. Yeah. But let me tell you what's interesting. Let's, let's talk about direct imaging for a moment because I just have to go on. This is such a cool idea, right? So what we really want in the next generation of space telescopes and such is we're trying to do direct imaging. We're trying to get 
uh, you know, an image of a planet separated from its star to be able to see the reflected light or the actual emission from the planet itself. Yeah, by the way, just to clarify, direct imaging means literally like a picture. A picture. But the problem is, is that with the t even with the 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 pre the thing that's going to come after JWST, it's going to be a pixel, right? You're not going to get any kind of resolution. You'll be able to get the light from it, which you'll be able to pass through a spectrograph, but you're not going to be able to take a picture. But there is this idea called the Solar Gravity Lens Telescope. I think that's what it is. And the idea is insane, right? So the general relativity says, look, massive bodies distort space. They actually curve space-time. So um, the sun is a massive body. And so that means that the light passing through the sun gets focused like a lens, right? So the idea is to send a bunch of telescopes out kind of into the Oort cloud and then look back towards the sun towards an exoplanet that is behind, not beh directly behind the sun, but is, you know, in the direction of the sun. And then let the, let the sun act like a lens and collect, focus the light mm -hmm. onto the telescope. And you would be able to get, and they've done, like, it's amazing. Like they've already, this idea is insane. They'd be able to get, if everything works out, 24 kilometer resolution. You'd be able to see Manhattan yeah. on a exoplanet. And this thing, it sounds insane, but actually, you know, NASA, they've already got, the team has already gotten through like sort of three levels of NASA. You know, there's, there's the NASA program for like, give us your wackiest idea, right? And then the ones that survive that are like, okay, tell us whether that wacky idea, you know, is even feasible. And then, and they're marching along. And the idea is that like, you know, and they even have plans for how you'd be able to get these probes out into the Oort cloud on relatively fast Time scales. You need to be about 500 times as far from the sun as Earth is. Um, but right now, everything looks like the idea seems to hold together. So probably when I'll be dead, but when you're an old man, <laughs> um, it's possible that something like this, could you imagine having like, yeah, res that kind of resolution, a picture of an exoplanet down to, you know, kilometers. So I'm very excited I, about that. I, I, I can only imagine having a picture like that and then there's some uh, mysterious artifacts that you're seeing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's both um, inspiring and and almost heartbreaking that we can see, like, I think we'll be able to see a civilization where there's like a lot of scientists agree that this is very likely something and then we can't. We can't get there. But you know, I mean, again, this is the thing about being long lived. We've got to get to the point where we're long lived enough that so let's say we found like this is what i always like to let's imagine that we find say 10 light years away we find a planet that looks like it's got techno signatures right it doesn't end there like that would be the most important discovery in the history of humanity and it wouldn't be like well okay we're done the first thing we do is we big bigger telescopes to try and do those imaging right and then the next thing after that we plan a mission there right there's there we would figure out like with breakthrough breakthrough star shot there was this idea of trying to use, you know, giant lasers to propel small spacecrafts, uh, light sails, almost to the speed of light. So they would get there in 10 years and take pictures. And so we'll, you know, if we actually made this discovery, there would be the impulse, there would be the effort to actually try and send something to, to get there. Now, you know, we probably couldn't land, we could, but, the, you know, so maybe we, maybe we take 30 years to build, 10 years to get there, 10 years to get the picture back. Okay, you're dead, but your kids are, you know what I mean? So it becomes now this multi-generational project. How long did it take to build the pyramids? How long did it take to build the giant cathedrals, right? Those were multi-generational projects. And I think we're on the cusp of that kind of project. I think that would probably unite humans. I think it would play a big role. I think it would be helpful. I mean, human beings are a mess, let's face it. But I think having that record, that's why I always say to people, discovery of life, of any kind of life, even if it was microbial life, it wouldn't matter. That to know that we're not an accident, to know that there is probably, if we found one example of life, we'd know that we're not an accident and there's probably lots of life and that we're a community. We're part of a, a cosmic kind of community of life. And who knows what life has done, right? We don't really, all bets are off with life. Since we're talking about the future of telescopes, let's talk about our current super sexy, awesome telescope, right. the James Webb Space Telescope that I still can't believe actually worked. I can't believe it worked. <laughs> I was really skeptical. I was like, okay, guys, we all only, right, sure. We, we only got one shot for this incredibly <laughs> complicated piece of hardware to unfold. So what kind of stuff can we see with it? I, I've been just looking through uh, different kinds of announcements that have been detected. There's been some direct imaging. Yes, like a single pixel. The kinds of exoplanets we're able to direct image, I guess, would have to be hot. 
hot, usually far away from the, you know, reasonably far away from the star. I think you know, JWST is really kind of at the hairy edge of being able to do much with this. What's more important, I think, for JWST is the spectra. And the problem with spectra is that there's not sexy pictures. It's like, hey, look at this wiggly line. But be able to find and characterize atmospheres around terrestrial exoplanets is the critical next step. That's where we are right now. In order to look for life, we're going to be, we need to find planets with atmospheres, right? And then we need to be able to do this thing called characterization, where we look at the spectral fingerprints for what's in the atmosphere. Is there carbon? Is there carbon dioxide? Is there oxygen? Is there methane? Um, and that's the most exciting thing. For example, there was this planet K218b, mm -hmm. which had, they did a beautiful job getting the spectra and the spectra indicated it may be an entirely new kind of habitable world called a Hycean world. Hycean meaning hydrogen ocean world. And that is a kind of planet that it would be a, uh, you know, kind of in the super earth sub Neptune domain we were talking about, you know, maybe eight times the mass of the earth, but it's got a layer of hydrogen, of an atmosphere of hydrogen. Hydrogen is an amazing uh, greenhouse gas. So hydrogen will keep the, uh, the planet underneath it warm enough that you could get liquid water. You can get a giant ocean of, uh, uh, of liquid uh, water. And that's an entirely different kind of planet that could be habitable planet. You know, it could be a 60 degree warm ocean. So the data that came out of JWST for that planet was good enough to be able to indicate like, oh yeah, you know what? The models, from what we understand about the models, this looks like it's a, it could be a Hycean world. And it's 120 light years away from yeah. Earth. Yeah. And so isn't that amazing? You can, it's 120 light years away, but we can see into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. We can see into the atmosphere so well that we can be like, oh, look, methane. Methane was a five sigma detection. Like you knew that the data were so good that it was like the, the gold standard of science.